Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on stream. Uh, we are going to give this a shot today. We don't actually know how long the internet will be up for. Apparently there was some kind of a significant outage in the area and I am told, although I don't know how accurate it is, that the internet is currently running quote unquote on batteries. I, I don't know what that actually means. Uh, I'm assuming it means some kind of a UPS or some kind of like bet large battery backup system but uh i think it could kind of go at any time so we're going to give this a shot if it uh if the stream craps out in the middle uh don't worry i am recording it locally and that's what i post for the video on demand so i will do the entire episode one way or the other and it will go up on youtube uh it's just people watching at home on twitch right now may find themselves without a stream if the internet cuts out, uh, because obviously there's nothing that's going to be able to be streamed if there's no internet. Uh, but that does not mean the stream is gone. It will uh, hopefully uh, return just fine. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, what we need to be doing today is moving towards a uh, <clears throat> stable voxel implementation for our lighting. We've done a lot of the groundwork, and let me sort of give you a uh, refresher for those of you just joining us as to where we are. Uh, in the process of implementing a fairly uh, good lighting solution in our game. Uh, you can see the little hero hopping around here and there is a, a light source above uh, the hero's head. And what's happening here is we're just running a very simple test at the moment um, that is picking the light source closest to wherever the um, various sort of parts of the, of the scene are. So for example, in here, uh, this would be like the closest light source uh, you can see there's a little uh, white square there that's showing the light uh, and you can see here that all of this stuff is getting lit by that similarly like up here it's getting lit by that uh, and so on and then what we're doing is there's some basic ray casting that we tested but right now it's sort of not hooked up in any particularly uh, smart way and we don't have a lot of ways of blending it in correctly so actually the uh, quality of the solution you see here is totally crap at the moment um, and that's actually not because our interpolation isn't good. Our interpolation was quite good. And in fact, uh, if we do casting against just the uh, single light source at the hero head, we get pretty good results. But what's happening here um, is that boundaries between where the light source would switch, we get artifacts because we just kind of overwrite uh, whatever was there before with whatever is there now, right? And so we don't really get uh, any we don't really get any coherence uh, at those places where the boundaries switch. And furthermore, we get no frame to frame coherence either. Um, so we don't get any smoothing or anything like that. And that's something that we also have to address because once we go and turn on the full uh, secondary bounce lighting as well, um, it's actually infinite bounce lighting we've gotten there uh, that we are sort of waiting to turn on. Um, that's going to need to be smoothed over time. And so for that, we need to keep it uh, as uh, as well. So we have ourselves set up to do all of this good stuff, uh, and I think we're kind of on the verge of having quite good lighting coming. We've done several tests over the past couple of weeks with very good results, and so now we're just trying to pull that together. Um, but the main piece that we're missing right now is a way of blending uh, light fields together. Now, what I mean by that, uh, and I, I can probably just go ahead and, and hook this up. I, I think we left this code path in there, uh, so I can probably do a really quick uh, reversion to it uh, to show you what I mean. Uh, but effectively what we're doing is we're doing a light field interpolation that's interpolating the distance from the light source effectively um, and the normal to the light source. That's sort of how the, the light field is being interpolated. Um, and I don't know that that's really the way that we want to do it, but what I can say about it is that by using sort of negative light values, um, as we sort of discovered, you can do some really amazingly high quality interpolation. Uh, much, much better than I ever really thought was possible in this case. Uh, we sort of stumbled upon it and I said, hmm, I wonder if we effectively use distance fields, we could do some good interpolation here. It turns out that I intuition was uh, quite right indeed. And we ended up in a situation where it kind of is something that I want to uh, test a little bit more uh, aggressively. So here we can see where we've got this uh, test cast from probes here and there's uh, you know test light transfer is a thing that's enabled right now and you can see us here uh, doing some um, light transfer from, from the voxel in here. I think we if zeroed this out uh, at the moment. Am I wrong about that? Let's see, end if, 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 end if. Uh, so here's the transfer version. Where is this coming from normally? Um, 
not dim. Let's see. Yeah, this is coming from the cells of the standing voxel, yeah. So basically, um, if you look at what's going on here where we, where we transfer these out, we're currently just getting them from our actual solution. If I was to turn that off and just get them uh, from some test spheres that we know the exact answer, uh, what hopefully you can see here is in our uh, in our running app, assuming this pass still works, uh, what you can see here is here's the light field interpolation. Uh, and as you can see, it's really remarkably good. And uh, you might be wondering what I mean by remarkably good, but if you look at like what you're seeing here in terms of like the edge on the sphere and stuff like that, if uh, you were to look at this and say, well, okay, so what's the big deal? Like, uh, you know, it, it just looks like you're interpolating some lighting. What you have to remember is this is actually reconstructing the lighting per pixel with nothing more than a 32 by 32 by 32 voxel. And this is the level of detail we're getting. I mean, look at that edge there, right? It looks like you're actually computing the lighting per pixel using the actual lights. Uh, and in fact, it has no such data, right? And just to underscore, you know, how, how good that is because it's relevant to today's work. Um, if I was to go into the OpenGL code here uh, and turn, uh, you know, go to the ZBIAS, uh, or I guess not the ZBIAS program, uh, but when we actually create the texture, um, instead of uh, using sort of linear interpolation, if I actually switch it back to uh, nearest interpolation, so you can see, um, for example, here in our lighting, this is where we're setting these up. You can see uh, the light uh, is, is set to linear here. If I set this to nearest so you could just see what it looks like without reconstruction, um, I, it's pretty ridiculous what it looks like when you don't reconstruct these fields just to look at what um, kind of data we're feeding into the lighting solution. So if I turn off uh, the linear interpolation so you can see what it looks like without reconstruction, here is the actual data that's going in there, right? That's what it actually has to work with, right? And so look at that. I mean, that's the resolution that we're storing the lighting at. And yet with the reconstruction function that we chose to use, um, we, were get, we get a perfect edge, right? And so that's why I say that that's kind of like a compelling argument for using this kind of a light field to reconstruct the lighting to the extent that we can, um, even though it's kind of an ill-defined problem because I'm just guessing, and I don't know, but much like I was guessing in the first place, um, I'm just guessing that if we're getting solutions that are this good from this reconstruction, if there's any way at all we can produce this light field from the full transport solution, um, oh my God, that lighting would look so good. And yet it's incredibly cheap to produce because we're only producing 32 by 32 by 32 samples in total, uh, nowhere near the kind of uh, density of uh, information that it appears like we're providing when you actually look at the results. And so that to me, um, again, pretty compelling. So that's sort of where we're at uh, in terms of what we are trying to do. So hopefully that uh, makes some sense to everyone. I'm doing a quick check here. It seems like the internet's still up. So, so far, so good. Um, all right, so what we need to do now, um, I'll go ahead back to the light transfer. Uh, so what we need to do now is start to figure out how we're going to talk about these light fields uh, and how we're going to produce um, the light field data that we're dumping down to the system. And like I said, this right here is just doing a light cast from the closest light source. And if we go and look at how that uh, code uh, actually works, well, what you can see here is that when we're in, in lighting computation, normally what we'll be doing is calling this compute light propagation call. We're not calling that right now because we're trying to do tests. So what we're calling is this test cast from probes. And what test cast from probes does is tech ca test cast from probes clears the voxel to begin with. And again, that's something that we actually never ever want to do. So our you know, short-term goal, you could think of it as coming up with a blending solution that means we don't have to clear our voxel anymore. Instead, we could just take the results from last frame and blend them with the results from this frame and get something usable. So that's like thing one. Thing two is we call get leaf, uh, light leaf for P. And what that is, is it does a spatial query into a spatial hierarchy that we built specifically for storing light sources. 
And that just tells you what are the closest light sources to you, right? Uh, and the reason that we need this is because we're gonna be doing some biasing of our sampling towards light sources. This is not that important right now, but we just wanted to test it um, because we're not trying to really attack that part of the sampling problem yet. Uh, so that's kind of a little bit for later, uh, but as you can see, like this right here is a pretty important thing um, for us to use kind of like going forward. And what we may want to do right now to make our testing a little bit simpler, um, you can see here that we get the light, uh, for every place that we go to cast, we get the light source that's closest to that thing. Uh, and that is probably something we don't be, want to be doing right now. We probably want to be doing something more like this, where we're just going to use just that, that one light source uh, that the player is hop the, the one where the player is hopping around and it's above their head. Um, we just want to use just that one light source probably, and that way we could debug a little bit easier. So here you can see me hopping around with that debug light source. Uh, you can see me hopping around the world, and you can also see that the Raycaster, uh, when you put it into this mode where there's only a single light source, and you can just see the results just from that light source, you can see that our Raycaster is doing a pretty good job as well uh, with the data. Like as I hop here, you can sort of see it goes out into that room and so on. Now again, our storage and our casting is very sparse, and that's why you get very blocky results, as you can see it kind of, uh, it's on that grid there, right? Um, and so that's why, like at the moment, you know, uh, this is not a particularly effective way of dealing with this light field. It has a number of problems, uh, one of which is that we're just kind of writing an off value in there, so we don't have the full interpolation that we need, so we need negative light values in there, uh, and that's something that we have to uh, work on. So that would make like areas like this look a little bit better, even just in a single uh, ray case. But the other part of it that's obviously a problem is that fact that all we're doing is a single binary like shadow on off. And of course, that will always, even if we make this look relatively clean and relatively smooth in there, it'll still always have what I would call that flashlight look. It still looks like the hero is just kind of emanating a light source out from them there's no bounce, right? Normally, if we shown a light in here, this would get some light, right? Uh, and if we don't have those secondary bounces, then they'll, you'll, you won't ever really see any light in there, right? And that is not particularly useful because we want that richness. So in order to get those secondary light bounces, again, we have the technology in there to compute them. We can call the uh, light propagation function and start to transfer light uh, around actually quite a bit. Uh, but before we can actually start taking advantage of that code path, and uh, there's one thing we have to write in there, which is the voxel sampler for that code path. But before we can start taking advantage of that code path, we're going to need some way of actually blending light samples together. Because in order to use uh, the secondary bounces, we have to be able to sum uh, some of these this light information uh, together, right? Okay, so that's kind of where we're at. And as you can see, even in this mode right now, um, if I was to pull back and move a little bit forward, you can see exactly uh, where we're getting good interpolation, like kind of right here. Uh, and then places like this where we're not getting particularly good interpolation, that's because around here, it's not really saying much about what has to happen. Uh, we don't really get negative light values in there, so we just get this kind of wobbly, like bad interpolation pattern. You'll notice this is not a stair step, and this is. Again, that's just because uh, in here we're just getting zeros rather than negative light values, uh, which is kind of what we need uh, to have happen there. And so we need probably some way of filling in that kind of information about the light sampling. So that's gonna be a challenge as well. Uh, and so when we look around in here, we see that problem immediately. And the other problem we need is that blending. Now for blending, we can also imagine testing that because what I can do is start to introduce some lighting lag effectively. This is updating the lighting every frame. And what I might like to do as a first step just to sort of get ourselves warmed up and try to start working with these uh, light fields that we kind of just sort of randomly invented and don't really know what they do because we don't have a lot of information about them yet. Um, what we want to do here is maybe introduce a little bit of light lag just to see if we can get cross flame blending working. So what I might try to do uh, is when we sort of um, hop through here, right? Uh, what I'd like to do is get it so that, that, that uh, there's just a delay. It sort of slowly fades uh, from one to the other. Not because there's any reason to want that slow fade right now, uh, but more because I know that I need to be able to blend these things across uh, frames in order to get enough samples once we start to do the more heavily sampled version. 
So that's what I'd like to start doing today. Uh, just by the end of the day, if we're lucky, maybe, we can get to the point where we get a nice delay in there. And all that is, is proving that we have a way of coherently storing light over time um, as we sort of uh, drive the, the, the simulation over a, a series of frames. All right, so we need two things. First of all, we need to stop uh, clearing our voxel, right? This is not going to be helpful. Um, and so we're going to need to, we might want to do something in there. We might want to do uh, some kind of reduction because if we're, if we're like adding things into the voxel as a blend, we may not want to uh, forego this loop entirely, but this may want to be like a multiplier or something where we reduce the values that are in there by some amount, right? Um, but if I stop clearing it, then what you'll see is as I move around, the light that I add just kind of stays where I'm putting it, right? Um, so if I leave an area, it will still have that light, right? You can see that there's still all this light in here. Um, so for example, if I go in here, right, I've added light to this area. As I hop here, that area is now in shadow, so it, it doesn't get updated anymore, right? And it doesn't get updated until I hop out and the voxel gets reset because it moves somewhere, right? And so everywhere that I touch where the light actually hits something, um, I am updating, but then any place where it doesn't hit, I'm not updating, and that's what you end up seeing there, right? Okay, so now what we wanna do is start blending these over time using some kind of a ratio. I don't know what exactly we want that ratio to be, um, but if you remember correctly, we were already doing something sort of like this before. Uh, you can see here we had some stuff like uh, from linear blend coefficient, we derive uh, some stuff here, right? We've got a comment about this. And what we essentially say is like, all right, look, the irradiance preservation is gonna be 59 60ths, right? Why? Because we want to take 60 frames to really like change the lighting significantly. Um, that's one second of game time. So we want kind of a one second laggy light source uh, behavior effectively. Uh, and you know, we might change that to something else over time just based on what we're doing, we don't know. Anyway, we come up with two values. One is Urblend U, one is Urblend V. Urblend U uh, is just whatever the value is effectively that um, we're gonna take the existing voxel values. That's what we're gonna preserve the existing voxel values as. Uh, and then Urblend V is sort of the new blend, right? That's, that's what uh, we're adding in. So we're gonna add in 1 60th effectively, right? and keep 59 60ths. And again, this is just an arbitrary thing. Um, you know, we could have made this 30 over 60, you know, who knows? We're gonna tune it however we want. I don't know why we've got T update in here. I'm not sure if that's even used anymore. That's probably old news. Um, yeah, it, it, this is just garbage at the moment um, that was used in kind of an old code path. So I might place it down uh, back in you know, where that that t uh, where wherever that uh, code actually gets called in here, yeah. There. Um, so we know we computed those values and we're going to use those values to tune the blending. But for right now, what we need to do um, is actually have those uh, sort of start to to control what the lighting is going to be. So let's suppose that we just did a very simple sort of. Uh, a very simple sort of use of those just to get ourselves warmed up, like I said. Um, what I want to do is say, here's the Urblend U and here's the Urblend V. I want those to be available in general across my functions. So maybe what I'll do is I'll just put those into the lighting solution itself. So if I go in here uh, to the lighting solution code, uh, you know, we'll just say, look, there's going to be these sort of accumulation values. Um, this is where they live. Uh, and then inside the solution here, when we're actually looking at those values, we set them up uh, like this. And now everyone can access them, uh, such as people uh, in test cast from probes. So then in test cast from probes, uh, like in here, I could do something where I keep some amount of the value that's in the cells of the voxel. Uh, for example, by just saying, look, whatever the color is of the light at that point, I would like it to decay a certain amount. Um, the certain amount of decay is going to be uh, that uh, ear blend U, right? And then down here where I'm actually putting uh, the, the casting values in, so when I, actually, uh, when I actually spam the voxel, you can see the, the voxel spam call right here. 
Uh, when we are in that spam voxel slice call, what I could do is say, all right, well, when we actually place these values in here, instead of just placing the value directly in, I'm just gonna use a summation instead. So I'm gonna use an urblend uh, v for that, and then that way we get sort of a, a new value for um, uh, for the that color. And I'm gonna do that with a normal as well. And this is just complete garbage, what I'm doing here, okay? So just wanna make that clear. Um, and we're gonna see a couple ways that it's garbage right off the bat, but it's very, very garbage. And uh, you'll sort of see why as we as we go. I'll try to cover all the, uh, the reasons why as we sort of encounter them. Uh, but I'm gonna do it for both here. So we're gonna do, um, both of these are gonna get uh, multiplied by the urblend u value. Uh, which will reduce them, and then they're going to get summed in there, right? Uh, so, oops, here we need the Lenning solution. Um, and so that's all I want to do to start, and that's just a simple sort of, like, lagging effect that we're going to put on there. Um, trying to see here if there's any other thing. I don't think so that I need to worry about. Uh, so I think that should be uh, fine. If there's one more, there it is. Oops. What did I do there? There we go. Sometimes the editor gets a little out of hand. Uh, all right. So what's basically going on in here, uh, as you can see, is we've introduced some light lag. But also what we're getting um, is it looks like we're over brightening this. And I suspect the reason for that uh, well, actually, I guess I'm not sure exactly why we're over brightening, so we should go take a look at why that is. Um, I probably messed up some term somewhere, but you can see that the lag that I introduced is in fact there. Uh, but it looks like we're adding more often than we should be. Oh, uh, you know why? I do know why. Uh, and this is exactly the thing that I was going to say, why the first reason why this is garbage, so we're okay. Um, so what's happening here, of course, is that when we do spam voxel slice, it's actually writing to an area uh, that's nine voxels around whatever the target is. What that means is that a lot of our writes are going to overlap. And when those values overlap, they're going to sum to greater than the total amount of light that should have been introduced in that area. Now, that's totally fine when we just have an equal sign because we're just going to overwrite whatever the old light value is, whatever the new light value is. So the fact that multiple people are trying to compete in that area doesn't really affect you. But as we're trying to move forward to get more accurate, more interesting lighting, we don't want that. We want to be able to sort of blend light things together, and we need to be able to take lots of different light information and blend it together in a way that doesn't produce over-brightening. So we can't just add everything together, right? That's not going to cut it. So what we want to be able to do going forwards, right, uh, is we would like to be able to sort of have our voxel uh, information that we're going to do uh, for this frame and then we're going to want to have the voxel stuff uh, that we had from last frame. And we want to be able to sum these to, to, together in some way that will normalize them correctly. So at the end, we'll end up with a summation that actually works, right? That actually sums to the correct um, sort of amount of contribution from the last frame and amount of contribution to this frame, no matter how many incoming samples we actually have at this location of the voxel, we don't want to care about that we want to be able to produce the result uh, regardless, right? So what that means is we're going to need some kind of a summation weighting value in here, right? We're going to need some way of saying, look, this is how much total light got added, and we need to renormalize, or it's how many total samples got added, and we need to renormalize based on that number of samples uh, to get us back to good. Now, when we look at what we've got here, you can see that we're keeping our large voxel dim in here probably there's not gonna be a lot of ways to do this in place. We're probably gonna to need to have um, sort of a buffer of the last frame's values and then a scratch buffer where we're computing this frame's values, right? Um, so what we're probably gonna need is something like this where we have like cells and new cells, right? Something like that. Um, and the reason for that again is because it might not be possible for us to really record the information in any other real way, right? Uh, and similarly, when we do light voxel cell here, uh, as far as new cells is concerned like this, um, this is probably not what we want to store. Probably what we need to store is like a light computation cell, something like this. Uh, and what that's going to have to do is record something else. 
So for example, it will probably need a total weight. You've seen me do this before. Um, and then like uh, a light C accumulator uh, and a light N accumulator. And again, these are probably not sufficient. We're probably gonna need more than just that information um, to record the light accurately in this area. So you're gonna see me expand that a little bit, uh, but the point is it needs this value as well. So this stuff that happens in the voxel cell by itself is probably not sufficient and we probably want a special type of storage just for our scratch computation, something like this, right? So when we do our light computation, we're probably gonna to wanna to have something like that. And we don't really know, but maybe we're gonna need something just more expansive over time in general, right? Now, if I look at where light voxel cell is actually used, we may get some insight as well. Uh, let me just go ahead and uh, see here, voxel cell. Yeah. So what you can see here is because this is really only used in our setup, what we could also choose to do if we'd like to is just boil these in line, right? So we could have a total weight in here um, and it, a light C accumulator uh, and a light and accumulator. Those could actually just be welded into where the voxel cell is stored. Again, I don't know how we want to set this up. It's premature to really think too hard about it. So I'm just going to put them together like that. Uh, and then what we're going to do is work with it here. So rather than have this thing uh, doing this uh, sort of blend here, what I want to do is set myself up to do the accurate blend. And so the first thing I'm going to do is clear that total weight. Uh, and then also the accumulators. So now we've got something that cleared all of our settings. And now I can accumulate into these. And then when we get to the very end, right? So after we've cast everything, then what I can do is I can go through and do just a nice stable uh, interpolation between the two of them uh, in here. And so the way that would work is I would go ahead and find out what the total weight was to begin with, right? And get a safe ratio out of it. So I'll get a normalization coefficient out of this by saying, oh, don't ask me why there's a zero there. <clears throat> leftover uh, from the old code path. Uh, so in here, what I want to do is take a safe ratio. So I get the inverse of the total weight. Again, this is just a standard one normalization. You've seen me do this a ton of times. Uh, and what I want to do now is normalize the light C and light N accumulators down so that they are rationally normalized values. Um, something that's based on the total amount of weight that went into them rather than having something to do with just uh, an arbitrary additive sum that we don't have any idea how many people put sums in there and we don't know, um, you know, how to get it back to uh, a value that's in line with the actual amount of light that, that came in. So what I want to do here is take the norm C uh, and the norm, uh, uh, the norm C for the light C, uh, multiplied by the light C and the light N. And what you can see here is when we're right there, this is probably not the best way to do this um, because what we probably want to do is do this after the fact. Right. So since we're already going to do a loop down here, I might as well clear it right after I use it like that. Right. That's a lot saner because what that'll do is make it so that while we're already touched them all and they're hot in the cache right here, we're about to, you know, we, we had to load them in anyway. We can clear them right there, probably mostly for free. Right. <clears throat> all right. So uh, that's all we need to do for this. But this just gives us the actual light C value. Right. This is the new light C. Uh, and the new light N, right? Now we actually need to do the lerp. That's actually pretty easy. Uh, that just is the light N, oops, uh, and the light C values in question um, are just gonna be lerps of their previous selves uh, with their new selves, right? Um, so this value here uh, is just gonna be this. And actually, I guess since we have coefficients, let me just do it that way. So first what we're going to do is use the Irblend V, or Irblend U value rather. That keeps, you know, 95% of the previous solution. Uh, and then what we're going to do is adjust this here probably, although we, we can sort of do it here instead. I don't, you know, uh, 
I don't know exactly how this routine is going to expand. Normally I could roll this right into this multiply here, but I'm not going to do that just yet because I'm not sure that's what I actually want to do. Going forwards, right? But so this is what we're doing here. Um, so this is just another linear blend, basically, right? <clears throat> At the moment. That right there gives us what we needed. Um, however, uh, we haven't actually done anything with the... Oop, I don't know why that's complaining. What? What is the issue here? Oh, uh, that's because it's hot code reloaded. Uh, yeah, we didn't remap that type. Um, so anyway, we'll be fine when we run again. The only thing I need to, to do now is I need these uh, where we're actually recording the information. Um, so where is our actual test cast here? Uh, spam box of size. Here we go. Uh, where we actually write these in, what we need to do now is actually write these in in some way that actually uh, preserves sort of that waiting information that we needed. So we're going to sum uh, the normal and the, the C accumulators here for use later. And then we're going to record the total weight. Um, and since we don't have any idea how important these samples are, uh, the total weight's always going to be one for everybody right now. All uh, of the information is going to be like equally valuable, basically, right? So now if we run it, we should get something um, that correctly lags the light source, but doesn't get infinitely bright over time. Um, in fact, it should just converge back to what we previously had. Um, and what you can sort of see is that's exactly what it does, right? So you see how there's about a one second lag there as it fills in? So anyway, um, that just shows that, you know, we can blend these values together over time and, you know, they're fine or whatever. Um, but, you know, as we sort of continue uh, through here, we sort of end up with the problem that, well, this sort of way of recording a light field really only records like one light field. So I'm not really sure how this would work if we were recording, you know, multiple light fields, right? Um, and trying to blend multiple light fields together. However, uh, we can certainly try and find out, right? Because one of the things that I nerfed just now um, in the test cast from probes, I nerfed uh, looking up a different light source per, right? But I could. Uh, that restores us sort of uh, querying a different light source per uh, voxel cast. Uh, and that looks like this, right? Um, and what you can see here is, well, uh, it does something, right? It's not horrible, uh, but it does sort of create some issues. And some of the issues it creates, for example, uh, like I was saying before, is that because we don't really know how to blend these types of values together, uh, we get some weird results. Like in here, for example, what you're seeing, I believe, uh, is the fact that when I add in the negative light from this uh, person, it kind of affects the light that should probably have been coming from this person. Uh, although I don't actually know that that's true. It may just be that the closest light source is always from here. So these never get computing light sources from here. It's hard to say. Uh, but point being, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in, in there now, which is not really correct. And so, you know, it's hard to make any kind of judgment calls about that interpolation at all, really. <clears throat> Um, but anyway, but it does sort of work. So it proves that our voxel sort of does do uh, one of the things we needed to do. However, the other problem that we have with it right now uh, is that the voxel isn't stable. So when we hop like between those two, for example, right, you can see that some things get cleared. Do you see that? Like that whole room got cleared. The reason for that is anytime the voxel moves around, the light values just stay there. We don't really do anything um, to try and make the voxel copy when we move where the world is relative to the voxel. So the other thing that I want to try and get done today, if we have time, uh, which I think we probably will right now. Uh, yeah, we've got, we've got an hour, so that's easy. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I think we could do that should be probably pretty easy uh, is if we just go ahead and try to copy the voxel so that when the voxel moves relative to the, or when the world moves relative to the voxel, we copy the correct block of the voxel out and clear the part that we don't know about uh, so it doesn't have like residual lighting values sitting around in there that are wrong. 
Okay. Wish I had more almond milk. I didn't start with enough almond milk. That was a big mistake. Okay, uh, so if we take a look at <clears throat> um, how this is working, our test cache should probably be able to stay the same as it is. The part that has to change right now is really the begin call, I believe. And so what you can see here is when we do begin lightning computation, we do a bunch of comp uh, sort of computations at the, at the head end of that, and we figure out where everything should go. And so here you can see us uh, computing these values, and then we push some volume outlines on there, right? And we get the lighting going. And what you can see is that if we look at where this, uh, how this happens, you can see the lighting voxel uh, are these two boundaries here, I believe. Um, and what those are is, uh, I want to say, and I don't really know if this is true. Uh, I'm kind of making this up. But I want to say that what we drew here is, this is the lighting bounce that's currently being computed. So basically, this is the hot voxel. It's 32 by 32 by 32. And we're actually doing work on that voxel. Um, but this bigger one here is just what we're storing. So because it's pretty free, like memory's cheap, um, it's pretty free for us to store a bunch of old voxel values so that when we like hop around, we don't lose them necessarily. So what we kind of want to do is store a large voxel filled with all of the data, um, but we don't really want to actually have to compute all that data. So that's what those two are. And so what we really want to be able to do now is say, all right, look, when we move where things are, we want to copy the block that was the hot voxel before. We want to copy that to wherever it is now, right? And leave the old stuff in place as much as possible, right? So we're just kind of scrolling. We're like, it's like screen scrolling, right? It's old tile map scrolling, um, but in voxel space, right? So the first thing I can do um, is I can sort of figure out like, well, oh, okay. Um, if this stuff is sort of aligned to a certain extent, right? And you can see that it is. Uh, because in here we do, um, well, actually, wait. Oh, no, we don't. So it looks like we never finished the alignment code either. Because you see that modulus operation and stuff there? It seems like this stuff isn't quite al aligned properly either. It looks like we're not actually doing the alignment. So I think we do want to do that part too. So there's two things we have to do. One is we have to keep the voxel aligned to the actual cells. Um, So I think we're okay. Yeah, I think it's okay. All right, so if we take a look at how this is actually working, right, um, let's go ahead and, and do some, some investigating here, but let's make sure that this stuff is, is working okay. Uh, so to start with, right, we know that the simulation origin, what we're effectively doing is saying, well, uh, we're gonna set the uh, size of the voxel here. Um, that's, that's presumably based on some multiple, like the vox cell dim and that stuff. Uh, when we initialize the lighting, that's going to be uh, based on sort of the, the, um, the fundamental unit size, right? You can see that here. Uh, and that fundamental unit size, right, is guaranteed to be something that aligns with the world units properly. Now, my assumption is that we are not aligned right now because we just assume that whatever the simulation center is, uh, that's where we are. But you can kind of see here, we don't actually know that that's true. Um, like all we're doing right now is saying that like whatever the minimum corner of the hot value is, it's always just based around the simulation center uh, minus the hot dim, but we don't actually know that the simulation center itself uh, is aligned or do we? Maybe we do. Because if it's aligned on fundamental units as well, then maybe we do kind of know that. 
Let's find out. So I'm going to set a checkerboard lighting pattern. Uh, and I just want to see how we are aligned here and whether it ever changes, right? Whether it ever flips around uh, so that we're not uh, aligned, we're, so that we're not always aligned with the world the same way. Uh, and this should be really, we, we've tested this before, it should be really uh, relatively easy to see. Um, so if we use a checkerboard pattern and I turn off the, uh, in the OpenGL uh, system here, I, I'm going to go ahead and just turn off the, filtering so I can see it a little easier. There we go. Um, so what you can see is that at the moment, right, the checkerboard pattern is aligned so that uh, we're kind of running down the middle. Uh, the, ch the checkerboard lines are running down the middle of the squares in X and they're aligned in Y. Uh, so middle X aligned in Y. Um, and then you can see that when I moved, right, like when I moved here to here, uh, it actually changed. So now it's in the middle of both, right? So what that tells me is that no, we are not always aligned the same in terms of world origin. Um, the world origin itself actually uh, is is sort of moving at different fundamental units there, like potentially 0.5. So what I'd like to do there is figure out uh, some way of making sure that we actually get that alignment properly. You can see here, so we can always be up to 0.5 off, it looks like, on the world origin. We're never anything other than 0.5 off, uh, but we definitely can be 0.5 in either uh, X or Y uh, versus... Uh, what the what the input is right Ooh, really. mm. that's at least what it looks like to me um like that seems seems pretty unmistakable so that's definitely i think the case uh my assumption is that has to do with how we're centering the world's origin um, that's my guess anyway. All right, so if, he, if I go to the code for the lighting that's actually doing that computation, uh, one thing that I then wanna do is I wanna say, all right, what's going on here with that? So as far as the world position origin P is concerned, uh, what I wanna do, I guess, is take a look if there's any sort of offset there. The fundamental unit if we go look at how the world works here, right? Uh, I'm going to look at that fundamental unit. Uh, let's see. Just going to search for where that's used. Um, so what you can sort of see here, right, is the fundamental unit is used to build everything. So everything's kind of built off of that. Uh, one fundamental unit, and you can see it creating the world out of them uh, as well, right? And so the world chunk dims are always a multiple of that. So what that means is that we should always be aligned as far as the fundamental unit is concerned uh, in the voxel, but if there's ever a non-integral, so basically like if, if we're ever uh, have any offset from there, from begin letting computation, if we ever any offset, we need to account for that. So basically what that means is that if I go into uh, the world position struct and we look, there's this offset parameter. If that offset is ever anything other than uh, a zero, then we would be slid sort of around from where the chunk boundaries uh, would be. So what I assume we would want to do to keep ourselves aligned to the voxel properly would be to say, first of all, we have to account um, for that offset value. So we need to start by taking the offset and moving back to where we should be. Uh, and then we can continue moving back to align the, the voxel um, completely with, uh, with that fundamental unit. So I think that would keep the voxel aligned uh, properly. 
Don't quote me on that, um, but that's what I think. Uh, and so now what we would see, hopefully, uh, and it does look like it's the case, is that checkerboard pattern should always align itself perfectly to the actual uh, world sort of placement of tiles that we had, which again is arbitrarily, it, it, like we don't care, just to be clear, because I know this might seem confusing, there's a lot in play here and it's all kind of in my head. I apologize, sometimes I take some things for granted. Um, but what you can see going on here, right, is we don't actually care at all. Uh, about whether or not, um, ooh, what that, that's, what is going on there? Do we have multiple, sorry to get distracted there, but do we have, for some reason, multiple of the same cube drawn in the same place there somehow? Or is that a voxel sampling bug of some kind? So that could just be a voxel sampling bug because it's right on the boundary. That's probably what's happening. So with linear interpolation, you wouldn't see any of that at all. So we're okay. All right. Anyway, sorry, I got distracted. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> so if we look at this, um, we don't care that the voxel is aligned to the world geometry. That we don't care. So we are free to place these squares however we want to. And we're also free to change our voxel resolution to be something totally different than this. It could be twice as large or half as large if we wanted to, right? What we want though, is we want whenever we move the simulation center by a discontinuous jump like that, like that, right? We want the voxel cells to be in the same place as they were before. So you don't want to slide a portion of a voxel cell over. So this was just my way of making sure that the voxel cells themselves always were on a fixed grid, even as we scroll around the world arbitrarily. And that's what's going on now. And you can see as I move here that the voxel doesn't actually remain exactly the same, right? It changed there. You see what I'm saying? Right, to a, to a different location, right? Um, and so I feel like to a certain extent um, that sort of underscores how that uh, how so, sort of that that different result is working there. Uh, but anyway, uh, you, you get the idea. So with that in mind, what I'd then like to do is say, all right, now that we've got that taken care of, let's see if we can go ahead and copy these values now that I know that they're at least uh, aligned. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and switch back and stop doing uh, the checkerboard pattern. All right. Uh, and what I'm gonna do now is I'm just going to switch to using the transfer that we were using before. Uh, and I'm gonna try and get the copy working so that it preserves those lighting values across the jumps, right? Now I've left, uh, I haven't turned linear uh, sampling back on. Uh, so we should still see like tile based stuff, but I kind of want that because it makes it easier for me to see what's going on, right? Um, and so that there provides a very good test case. That jump where the voxel just clears there, that's what we want to stop happening because there's no reason for it to clear just because the simulation center changed, we should be able to preserve all of our light values still just fine. Okay, so how would we know that that's happening? Well, the first way that we know that that's happening is when we look at this incoming value uh, for the world position of the origin P, uh, what we know there is if we were to track that value, then as the world position moved around, uh, we would know because we could compare it, right? So what we could do is we could say in the lighting solution, let's just store whatever the last one of those was. So we can say last origin P, like so. Uh, and here we can say, look, did it change? So we can sort of have like a uh, center moved Boolean value where we can just say like uh, R equal to, if these two um, are not equal, and again, we don't actually want to make them exactly equivalent here uh, because we don't care actually about this offset, this minor offset. So we could choose to zero that out, 
right? That's one thing that we could do. And uh, so what we might want to do is something like this. Take the uh, origin P that we have, change the offset to zero, and just remember that part. So if the center moved, we would say, look, if these two are not equal anymore, then the center definitely moved. I don't know if we actually have an R equal for them. Looks like we do. Um, and then that last origin P can now just be stored. <clears throat> And that just gives us a way now of knowing when do we actually have to, oh, looks like we don't actually have one. Sorry, I spoke too soon. It looks like actually R in same chunk is all we really needed. So actually we could just do this. Amusingly enough, we already had a thing that does exactly this comparison. So if these two are in the same chunk, um, then the center didn't move, right? Uh, and so that's all we would actually have to do. And then what we want to know, uh, uh, again, is just like, what's the difference between these two, right? Like, how would they actually, ha how would we actually have to copy the voxel from one to the other? Uh, and so what we could do here is say, well, okay, let's just say if the center moved, then what we need to do here is actually perform that copy. So we need sort of like a delta for how, uh, you know, what, where the voxel, uh, how many pieces the voxel should copy over, basically, right? And so in order to figure that out, what we need to do is take the uh, difference between these two values and then use however many fundamental units that actually is. So what we would do is say, well, the origin P, right, the, the, the new one, um, that has in it, in the world position, uh, a chunk difference here, right? So we kind of want to figure out what that chunk difference is. So we have our chunk x, and we want to subtract uh, that from the one that we know, and that gives us a, like a d chunk x, right? And so in here, what we could do is just compute what these offset values actually are, and then we would know, like, this is how far we actually had to go. So we did this, we, you know, moved this far in each of the, the um, dimensions. But of course, that doesn't really tell us how many voxel cells we moved. That tells us how many world chunks we, need, we moved. And it, we now need to also know what the world chunk size is in terms of uh, voxel values. And that's also something that we can store. So in other words, inside our LUTTY solution here, what we can also do is record um, maybe something like this, right? Uh, and in fact, this should probably be this. We didn't have V3S's implemented at the time when we wrote the chunk stuff, so that's why they're not uh, stored as those to begin with. We should probably go back and change that. Oops. So what you can see here is we're just saying, look, we've got a delta that's the chunk delta, and here it is, but now we need to multiply that um, out so that we have some idea of how many voxel cells that is. So this would be like voxel cells per chunk, right? And that's a V3S because the voxel cell, the chunks are not the same, they're not cubic, right? They're actually rectangular. So the voxel cells per chunk multiplied out, uh, so we've got our D chunk times our voxel cells per chunk is how many voxel uh, units we moved during that frame. So if I do that, uh, now I've pretty much got the information I need if I can provide that voxel cells for chunk value, which at the moment, I don't actually know what it is. R in same chunk uh, doesn't seem to be available. 
That's probably just because it's not exposed. Uh, let's see here. We need our world val. We need our um, our world to be passed in here. Uh, and we would need that anyway. Uh, so when we do begin lighting computation, we would need that because we also need to use that world value because it's the only thing uh, in here that actually knows, for example, what that fundamental value actually is. So uh, if we look in, uh, into the world data, the chunk dim in meters is what's going to tell us that, right? Um, so actually, I suppose we can do this math every frame. It's not expensive. I can probably not bother storing it in the light solution, even though it is going to be constant. Um, what I could do here is say, look, the uh, voxel cells per chunk, uh, this can just be a round where we just do the divide. So we could just say, all right, we know that the world has a chunk dim in meters. That's how big a chunk is. We then want to divide by however big these voxels supposedly are. So this is vox cell dim, right? Um, and this would give us the information we actually needed, right? Uh, that's pretty much all there is to it, I think. That would give us the correct value. Oops, I don't know what that's still doing there. Um, These have to be pointers. And these is Fox cell dim, a vector I assume, uh, need to be accessed by their members. That's about it, I think. And so I don't know if we have a Hadamard product for V3s. Uh, we probably don't. It looks like we don't. A Hadamard product for V3s is, is the same as a Hadamard product for V3s. It's just an integer multiply instead. Uh, so it's really not a big deal. All right, so begin lighting computation now needs to have the world passed down that's being used. Uh, and that's not a big deal. Uh, we obviously have that data anytime. All right. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and see if we can get this going. Uh, and I want to step through that code as well, and I want to look at uh, what the values we compute actually are. Um, so when we're doing the copies here, uh, like from here to here, we're going to need to do the copy based on that dechunk value. Uh, and so that's going to you know, assume that this computation is correct. I want to switch to debug mode. I want to look at the values we computed to make sure they look sane uh, before I implement the actual copy. So I'm switching the O2 to an OD, which tells the compiler, obviously, to compile in debug mode. Uh, and then what I want to do is just set a breakpoint right here. Uh, so I know that the center will move sometimes. Uh, I'd like to probably break like there. Uh, and if I'm right, I should be able to hop. Uh, what's going on here? Why, why am I not getting anything? There we go. Um, I should be able to hop across the boundary like that and cause a move. And when I cause the move here, what I should be able to now do is look at voxel cells per chunk, um, which should give me uh, 17, 9, and 3, which is exactly what it did. Uh, and then I should be able to look at dechunk, which is how far we actually moved. And it should tell us how many chunks uh, we went in any particular direction. This claims we went one chunk in Y. I could sort of believe that. I don't really know if that's true or not, though. Um, because we don't have a lot of information about uh, where the actual coordinate centers are at the moment. So it could be true, could be false. We may have to debug that. Um, looks like a pretty straightforward calculation now. Uh, and then if we take a look at dvoxel here, uh, we're, gonna, we're about to compute that. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like uh, it went out of scope, but actually it looks like Remedy preserved it for us. So it's nine in this case, right? So this is claiming that our solution, our um, coordinate center moved up by nine, uh, but that's all it did. Let me take a look at the origin P here. All right. 
Oops. Here's the one we had before. So it looks like we went from 0, 0, 0 to 0, 1, 0, um, supposedly, as our coordinate center. Um, and I mean, all right, you know, I could believe that. I don't necessarily know it's wrong yet, but we haven't really done much to verify whether it is or isn't. All right, so let's go ahead and take a stab at the copy. Um, again, we've got some, you know, we have a fair bit of time left, I think. Uh, I think we should be done in about, what, 40 minutes or something like that. Um, so if I go in here and just go ahead and, uh, and the stream does still seem to be live, by the way, those batteries must be pretty good whenever the, they used on that. Um, yeah. Anyway. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, moving along, if I go in and actually take a stab at the copy in the begin lighting uh, computation call, uh, what you can see here is that if the lighting is enabled and we have a center movement occur, then what we're going to do is we're going to try and copy the voxel. We're going to scroll the voxel by this much, right? Uh, and in order to scroll the voxel that much, what that means is we're trying to copy, we need to copy uh, each of the sort of dimensions of the voxel in that way, right? So if the voxel is supposed to go, you know, if we're moving two uh, voxel squares, uh, you know, along X, then we need to copy the voxel two voxel squares backwards along X in order to keep it aligned uh, with where the world now appears to be. So if you imagine just doing this like for one axis, so let's suppose we were gonna do it for the Y axis since that's the one we currently have a test for, then what I would need to be able to do is I would need to be able to say, all right, um, I know that I'm going to have to uh, do a copy either forwards or either forwards or backwards, right? Uh, so let me do just a, an if statement here as, this, as a simple way of doing it and say, look, if dvoxel.y is less than zero, uh, and, and this is not probably how we're gonna do it in the end, but I wanna just walk through it uh, doing the fully explicit way, oops. first. Uh, so if you take a look at what uh, we're going to do here, if we are going to walk over, um, so the delta voxel movement was negative, meaning the player moved in negative y. Uh, then we want to move the voxel in positive y, right? And I should probably draw this out because I realized that didn't really probably make any sense what I just said. I'm going to try and make it clear. I'm sorry. All right, so thinking about this purely in one dimension at the moment, um, although I'll draw it this way because we're talking about y. So if this is our one dimension, this is y, uh, and it's going this way, right? Then this way would be negative, this way would be positive. If I have my voxel, uh, and so I'm gonna go ahead and put one down, you know, there it is. Uh, if I have my voxel and what I'm saying is, okay, previously, I know that the simulation center, right, was like right here. So this is where the simulation center was. That value is last origin P, right? But now when I look and we call this the, you know, function again, what I see is that now I get this. So this is now origin P, right? This value, uh, so this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. This value is 4, 5, 6. This value is 6. So when I subtract, uh, you can see in the code here, right, origin minus last origin. When I subtract these two, I subtract 6 from 4, and I get positive 2. What does that mean? It means that the player, well, the origin, the camera origin, right, or the, the sort of simulation origin, moved forwards two units like that. That means that now it, this location 
is effectively uh, this location, right? And for me, what I need to do is I need to take this part of the voxel and move it down so that it's actually here, right? So what that means is everything that was in the voxel, every square, like if this was A, A has to get moved there. So every voxel square needs to be moved two backwards from where it was. So, you know, voxel i minus two has to be equal to voxel i, right? Or voxel i needs to be equal to voxel i plus two, right? So this is the uh, update step that I need to be able to do. Uh, and when I'm doing it, I have to be careful not to overwrite values I'm actually going to need. So for example, <clears throat> let's suppose that I'm doing this particular copy. Uh, if the first thing that I did was I updated this cell by copying this into here, well now I've lost the ability to correctly update this cell because this cell was supposed to be what was here, but I've already overwritten what was there with what was here, right? So in addition to making sure that I do this properly, these two things are not equivalent when the source and destination are the same, right? If I'm going to do this, I had better make sure that I pick the order of i, uh, of iterating over i, that doesn't overwrite values that I haven't previously moved, that I haven't already moved to their new locations. And you can see which order that would work in quite cleanly. If it was a positive move, so I'm going negative, right, in terms of, I, I, you know, things are going this way, I would want to walk the voxel this way, meaning I would want to set this value first because it's grabbing from, like, here. Then I'd set this value because it's grabbing from here. Then I'd set this value because it's grabbing from here, right? I always want to walk in the same direction as the movement of the center was, not the direction I'm moving the voxel. Because the reason I'm moving the voxel, if I walked in that direction this way, right, then as I, uh, as I update these values, this value needs to be grabbing from here. There is nothing there, nothing there. This value grabs from here. This already got overwritten, right, with whatever the blank value was or whatever, right? So it, it doesn't really work to go in the opposite way. All right. Um, so when we look at the D voxel, like I said, we need to we need to go in the i uh, direction that corresponds to that. So when I do my for i loop for the d voxel uh, y in this case, what I need to do here is I need to make sure that I'm, uh, if it's less than zero, then I'm going backwards, right? So I would say that the uh, y value for my voxel in this case uh, is gonna start at the maximum y, vo y value. like so. Um, whereas if I was going in the other direction, I would need to make sure that I would start at zero and end at the light large voxel, like so. So in this case, you can kind of see where we're at, right? These are the copies that we need to do, and the actual copy we need to do is pretty straightforward. This dvoxel value here tells us how far we're copying. So actually, when we look at what's going to go on here, if you look at what we're going to write in this particular piece of code, if we're going to copy two of the voxel squares, uh, we've kind of got that here, right? Here is what we would need to do for our copy. If we're copying in y, uh, and I guess we can fill in this in its entirety. And since we're only copying in Y, I can put in the other ones here as well. Okay. So if we do this, where we're going to run over all of them and then do a Y copy on each one, and the Y copy is discriminated, I can also put that in here for now. Like I said, we're going to kind of have to make this a little bit more flexible eventually, but for right now, we can do it this way. 
Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, so doing this copy in here, we then need to figure out, okay, so what does the copy update actually look like? And so if we're going to assign this particular cell, this ZYX cell here, uh, we know we have to uh, use this form of the equation where we're doing, uh, well, I guess it doesn't really matter which direction we choose to do it in. It will just depend on how we write this particular code. But if we're going to update the voxel that we're stepping on in order, right, then the one that we're going to grab it from is the opposite direction of whatever the, <clears throat> the dvoxel value was, right? So this is just going to be dvoxel y, right? It's y minus dvoxel y. And what you can see about this routine is that we can't actually execute this routine if this value, <coughs> excuse me, uh, would actually be out of bounds, right? If it's out of bounds, there's nothing we can, you know, we, we, we can't really um, uh, fetch outside our voxel. That would, that would be very bad. So what we need to do instead here is we need to think about, well, what could we actually iterate over in this case that would, would actually work? Um, and what we know is that if we're fetching y minus the dvoxel y, we know here that the y value is less than zero, right? So we know that this is going to be effectively a plus, right? We're sort of fetching uh, whatever the, you know, that far forward, right? So it'd be the plus two case, the bottom one there, right? Um, that means that this value has to be pre-offset so that it's got to be at least as low as dvoxel y, right? So in this case, right, it would not be able to fetch even if the value was zero, right? Um, and if the value was, you know, one, then we want to take into account that we have to be one less than that, right? And so this routine here would do the voxel copy exactly as we need it to do, but what do we do with the remaining cells, right? And so what we would like to do there is we also need some way of like just clearing whatever's in there, right? So what we'd like to do here is instead of this, we'd like to also be able to talk about the area we're not actually going to touch. We know we will touch um, basically everything from light, light, large voxel dim, minus one, minus D voxel Y, all the way down to zero. But depending on how large this is, that could be like none of the voxel if it's large enough, right? So what we wanna do here is basically say, look, let's clear everything else. We know this is the first value we'll touch, right? So let's say we know what that is. We know what our max y bound is. So then when we do the copy here, we'll just say, all right, let's go from that max y value, which we know we actually will use. We'll go from that plus one uh, and we'll clear everything else. So that would clear it out, right? So now we have the negative version of the routine uh, that we think would probably work correctly. I mean, who knows, right? Uh, and then we're gonna need the same uh, thing to happen, but in the other direction. So we're gonna have to have one where we're grabbing from things that are behind us as we go, right? And for that to work, we're gonna need to do uh, something where we do the opposite. We're gonna need to start with dvoxel y, because we know we're gonna subtract that much of it away, right? Um, we know it's positive now, right? And so in this routine, we're gonna start at zero and we're gonna go until we hit min y, right? And we're gonna start uh, here at zero, I'm sorry, uh, my, I'm gonna start at min y, right? We're gonna go until uh, we hit the end of the voxel and we're just gonna go upward, subtracting away from backwards. So here we know we can just go until we hit min y like that uh, and do our plus plus there, right? Uh, okay, so that's a sketch of the routine. It's probably a little bit buggy because I it's hard to type It's hard to do stuff like that while you're talking uh, if you ask me um, But that's what the copy is supposed to do. Uh, we'll see what it actually does. Although that was a pretty bizarre situation um, Looks like that routine is is a little bit busted there as you can see um, But anyway, that's 
that's the basic idea. So let's go ahead and step through this and debug this, right? So the first thing we want to do is make sure that our X and Z values are dealt with appropriately. And I think they probably are, right? Because all we're doing here is going from uh, zero to light large voxel dim in both cases. And so presumably that part of the routine couldn't really be all that bad, right? Um, furthermore, if we assume that this was going to do just another uh, Y loop in here, I would think we wouldn't have any problems. So let's assume that that's okay for now. We could take a look, closer look at it if we think there's something weird happening there later. Uh, so then we just have two cases here, right? Uh, and uh, we, we sort of talk through what each of them is gonna be. Let's make sure we kind of know what's going on. So let's say that D voxel Y in this case is negative two, right? Um, ah, yeah, so this, this is the problem right here. You can already see it. Uh, so let's suppose this was uh, negative two. That means that we're going to be fetching. So for every y, we're going to take and we're going to uh, do two ahead of it, right? The problem is if I subtract a sub negative value, I'm actually going forwards. What we really wanted was this. We just messed up the sign there, right? Um, is that a puss? Hello, puss. Do you want to say hi? Say hi. It's up, it's up here, baby, baby, it's up here. Do you see, do you see? That's the, that's the folks at home. The puss don't understand uh, the camera very well. She do doesn't, I'm sorry she doesn't acknowledge any of you out there, but she doesn't know about the camera. She doesn't know what that means. She just think it's a little thing that sits on top of the monitor and does nothing. You know, they don't have webcams uh, in cat land. They don't do video conferencing. Um, so, I can't really explain it to the puss. She don't, she don't like it. She doesn't understand. Anyway, um, point being, that's the way that should have been written. That was just a sign error there. Um, I think the rest of this looks okay. Uh, let's just take another look at it real quick here to see if we still have uh, an issue with that. All right, uh, so waiting is sort of, we probably want to compile in release mode so that the lighting update is fast enough uh, for us to actually uh, use properly. But uh, let's go ahead and see here as we move along. Um, there's us jumping into the next thing. You can see it did not apparently copy correctly. Doesn't look like it did. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's updating correctly at all. Uh, so we're still doing something kind of weird there. Not sure what exactly, um, but we'll take a look. I also, I'm going to go ahead and switch uh, to O2 here for a minute, just because the speed at which it updates now that the lighting is blending um, kind of makes it a little bit hard to see what's going on there. Uh, so you can see it's still disappearing there. And so I don't think our copy is, is working the way that that uh, I was trying to get it to. But that's the basic sketch of, of uh, the routine. So yeah, um, trying to make sure I thought all that through properly. And then I don't actually want to go like the other direction or something like that. But I'm pretty sure that's the way it's actually supposed to be. If you go plus two, everything in the voxel does move negative two. That's definitely true. I don't see any way that that could be false. So I believe this update step is the correct way to do things like in Y. You know what? No, this is wrong again. So I did it. When I typed this in, I did it exactly the wrong way again. This is the same way as the delta if you write it in this format, right? I mean, I drew that out right here, right? So that's, that's just stupid, uh, again. Because again, this is, if this is negative, then this becomes negative, right? So you are fetching from someone who's lower down than you were, and that's what you want. In this case where it's positive, you're fetching someone ahead of you, and that's what you wanted. So this is the correct update step uh, in both cases, and so I'm not sure what was up with that, other than me being stupid. All right, let's try that one more time.
Um, so that looks unhappy there with that fetch step. Uh, and again, that looks a little bit suspicious just looking at that code again. So assuming that Y was positive, right? Um, If that's trying to fetch below us, it should look like that. So I'm not sure why I flipped that one. That was probably me just being overzealous. All right, so it looks like we sort of made a slight improvement there which is to say that our forward copy is still borked, but our downward copy was stable. You can see how the lighting did not black out there, right? So our upward copy is... is borked there. Hold on a second. Uh, so if we take a look at these right here, you can, I just want to verify that I'm not imagining things because that sure looked like the copy was working in one direction, right? Um, so if you take a look at what happens here, <clears throat> you can see that the top copy is working properly, I believe, right? Uh, and if I was to comment this out so that we weren't doing any work, we should get a clear in both directions, if I'm not mistaken, right? I don't know why I'm restarting. Well, so maybe not. I mean, we do get a discontinuous light jump, but it wasn't going to black. So if I turn this one back on, yeah, but it still looks like that's much more continuous. So I don't know. I think this is this one actually is working, although it was less of a pronounced one. So let's focus on this one now. Uh, so yeah, again, looking at this one, if we take a look at what the minimum Y value would be, uh, when we're talking about how this is gonna be copied, uh, again, we're trying to figure out how to copy this. Uh, it should be from people. It should really be, I feel like this is just, uh, this is, yeah, it's just a little too head spinny. Um, this is the kind of code that I always hate writing it. I feel like you just need, you need something that just shows you how this copy is working in a little diagram, which would take, you know, not very long to write. Uh, but it's just the th sort of thing that we don't ever have tools for. Uh, but anyway, if you take a look at the way this is working, right? We're saying dvoxel y is less than zero. That means the user moved in the negative direction, right? which means that the voxel needs to move in the positive direction. So everybody who is in a particular location, uh, if the voxel is moving in a positive direction, someone who is at i goes to i plus one, which means that i plus one goes to i minus one, which in this case would look like this, right? So that is a correct interpretation of that statement. If the devoxel was positive, then people need to move. So people who were at Y are going to move um, to Y minus one, which means that people at Y get their value from Y plus one, right? So this actually did seem like how it should have been written. You know what I'm saying? And when I look at how this value is supposed to go, 
that suggests to me that actually, uh, yeah, these, this is pulling from a negative, which means you presumably need to go backwards or this is pulling from a positive. So that means presumably you have to go, um, in forward order, which, so this just seems, yeah, so this, this just seems like this was maybe written slightly different, slightly wrong. So if you take a look at how this works, the y value here, we can start at zero, right? Because you're always adding something to it. And we just need to stop before we get to uh, what that maximum value would have been, right? So max y is still the correct thing. It's just the way we wrote these routines, yeah. So max y is still the correct thing to compute, and it's still going to be, you know, light large voxel dim minus one uh, minus d voxel y now, right? So we were almost there, but not quite. Uh, and if we look at how this is going, um, if you look at how this would be fetched, right? It's actually, since this is going from that max y, this, this here is fetching downward as you go. So this is not the correct loop, right? The, we had like the two loops inverted. This one needs to always go from here and it's going to go down to a min y, right? That is the lowest it could go. And, and that in this case is this, right? So yeah. Uh, just kind of had things spun around there, which was not surprising for this kind of code. Um, and that means that this here is going to have, you know, these two loops are going to be in the opposite place, right? Um, so we had them kind of backwards. Um, so yeah, I think that's okay. And then here we're just going to take that initial part and clear it because these are the ones that, you know, we, we don't actually know uh, where they would go because there's, there's nothing for them to fetch from, right? Uh, and this one here, we we're just saying, all right, uh, we have to take that sort of end of the array and clear that out. Uh, but I believe that's correct. Uh, and then my only concern is, do I have the two movements in the right place, or are they? Is it actually the opposite for D voxel? Um, but we'll see. There we go. Um, so now that copy is correct. Again, kind of, it's a little bit uh, difficult to work it all out in your head uh, like that. But you, when you write out the routine, but you know, again, you take it one step at a time, and you can work it out. Uh, so now the voxel is being copied around stably, so we get sort of uh, a stable result as we would expect. Um, and now we just need some way of dealing with that on all three axes, right? Because you can see, as I'm moving around in here, um, we sort of have a problem where it's unclear exactly, uh, it's unclear how we would structure this routine to do it for all three. But we can start by making this a little bit more generic, right? Um, let's try to rewrite this so that it's, it's something that uh, can be done like more cleanly, right? Um, that doesn't require maybe so much ifing around. Uh, so the first thing I could say is, well, what if I introduce a dx or a dy value, right? So what if I said like, okay, we've got a dy value. The dy value in this case is negative one, right? Um, and so I just said y plus equals dy like that. Um, and so in this case, the dy would be one, right? So I could have that and that would be the same loop. Right, I haven't changed anything, but now I've got like part of my loop looking the same as it used to look, right? Uh, and if I run the code, it, I should get the same results, right? You know, nothing, nothing changed there. Um, and so the next thing you could do is say, well, all right, so I have a max y um, and like a min y. I could start talking about these like a little bit differently. For, for, so for starters, instead of greater than or equal to min y and saying, well, that's lowest you could go, I could just say, well, suppose I just made it like be not equal to, right? 
So if I wanted it to stop at some point, I could say, well, whatever negative voxel y is, that's the lowest I can go. And I want you to stop after you process that one, right? So if I just added dy to it, right? Like if I just said, well, whatever the lowest value actually is that I want, if I then go one more step after that, that's the one that I should stop on. Um, so I could call this stop y and just say, well, let's change it to a not equal to, right? And then that would be the same thing I could do here. I could just say, well, that's a stop y value. When you get to it, don't use it. And this one didn't process it anyway, so I won't have to adjust the value, right? Um, so now if I compile that, in theory, I again have not changed uh, the actual rules, right? Uh, but I do have a problem, I can't test it yet, um, because these routines were using those values. Um, but what I could do is say, well, actually, um, if we look at what these are doing, they're really just going to do the rest of the routine anyway. They're just going to skip the, the, they're just going to do the last part that this thing failed to do. So maybe if I just initialized my Y loop uh, with a Y value that persists and got rid of it, um, you know, like here or something, right? What I could do is say, well, what if I just continue on down the road um, and maybe introduce some other value that's like a final Y value. So effectively these become while loops. I say, you know, that. So while we have not gotten to the min Y value, or rather I should say the stop Y value, right? Um, you know, keep going in this case while I have not gotten to the final y value, uh, you know, keep going. And then I would just need to know, well, what is the final y value, right? Um, and in this case, the final y value is just gonna be like dy, right? It's like, I wanna stop at zero, right? But I wanna actually process zero, so I want like one step past zero, right? Is the one I would stop at. And then presumably I could do the same thing here. So like I've got to stop Y value. I can initialize Y outside the loop to whatever it should be. I could do a while loop that says, you know, go until you think you should stop. Uh, updating the value like this the entire way, right? Uh, and then here I just need to make sure that it just keeps going until the final value and the final value is just this. And that seems, you know, somewhat sane, right? I think. Uh, and let's see if that works at all. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Forgot one of my increments. Sorry, folks. Um, and so that looks pretty reasonable. It looks like it's working just like it was working before, right? Um, but now what I've done is I've made it so that I can compute these values separately, right? These values could actually be computed like this. And then if I take a look at what I'm left over with for my loops, right? If, if I look at what they look like, they look the same. Right. So what I've done is I've just kind of mechanically gone through and changed out the values inside the loops till they could be converged. And now my loops are exactly the same. So I only need one copy of the loops. Right. So if I then take these outside of here, right. And I just say, all right, these are the values that I need to actually compute. Uh, this you know, set of values, dy, stop y, y, final y, right? Um, then I can just compute those outside and have one set of loops inside. Make sense? Uh, this is kind of nice because this means that I don't have to uh, actually have any conditionals in the control flow of the thing. Um, the entirety of the way that this loop works can be entirely self-contained, right? 
All right. <clears throat> so it's a little more complicated than this, unfortunately, um, once we actually start to, co to compose these two, but that's just kind of the, the basics, right? Uh, if I now compile this, I should get something that works uh, very, oops, did I miss one of these? There we go. There we go. Oops, what happened there? Oh. Obviously. This must be set anew each time through. So again, this is really just making sort of a parametric for loop, like a for loop that we can control uh, more explicitly as we go. Um, and so that's just sort of collapsing it down into something that can be driven entirely with like a little tiny packet of information, which is this. Um, if we look at these a little bit more closely, you know, we, can all, we could probably see that there's actually some other patterns here that we could uh, extract and even make this potentially a little bit simpler. But what I want to get to is obviously this works the same no matter how many dimensions we actually have. Right, um, so we could actually do this the same on x, y, and z, and the only really problem that we have here is that when we're going to clear these things, uh, they're sort of inclusive rather than exclusive, right? So if we actually just want to talk about the copy, um, that's pretty easy. It would look something like this. Uh, right? And so these loops could all just work and that would be all we would really need. This code would be identical for all three axes, right? So we could do it the same on all three of them uh, and then we would be done. Uh, the problem that we would have uh, over here is with this part, right? Um, so the problem that we'd have here is in order to actually do the clearing, we can do the clearing on all of the X's here, but then we kind of have to go out on the Y's over and over again. Now, and it's a little ugly, uh, but you know what? It's not the end of the world, so we could just do it. Um, what that would look like is this. Uh, so here we iterate over the X's we have, then we iterate over the X's we don't have, clearing each one, right? Then, uh, as we sort of fall out of the Y loop, we then need to loop over the Ys like this. <clears throat> and say for each of those, we need to clear all the Xs. Right? So we're only doing a portion of the y's, but for each one of those, we need to clear the entire x row, right? And then the same thing is true for the z's. But it gets even worse. Right? Hopefully that makes some sense to everybody. So this would then have to be copied, right? Three times, uh, one for each of the axes, 
So you'd have to basically be like, okay, you know, uh, here comes the X version, right? Which just looks like this. Uh, and then finally we'd have the Y version, I'm sorry, the Z version which looks like this. Uh, and in theory, then, that would do all the copies, right? Right? In theory, assuming I didn't screw something up, which I probably did, right? Uh, don't ask me what is going on there. Uh, and now, you know, maybe uh, if, we, if we get that debugged or whatever, you know, maybe there's some bugs in it still, but that's that's what we'd have to do to clear to process everything um, in the system properly. Let's see if that has everybody in the correct place before we say what I'm going to say next. Yeah. Um, so the only thing we really have to change is this right here uh, still needs to have the voxel. Uh, offset for each of these things, right? Um, but other than that, uh, this may be it, right? Um, so there's the copy version, right? Uh, and you know, it seems okay. Uh, and it seems to sort of be working. I do see some bugs sort of in the outskirts, but that may be because our voxel uh, isn't large enough when the lighting center moves too far. I'm not sure. Um, but you can sort of see that now we've got that stable copy happening everywhere. Okay. Um, but if I isolate this piece of code, uh, what you can see is that it's really rather absurd, right? So if I take this and I put this out here, um, what we can actually do is we could take this piece of code and we can make it just a routine and we can say it's block copy voxel. And all we really need uh, to know is like, what's the cell thing that you wanted copied and uh, what's the D voxel, right? And then we could just call this block copy voxel function and then I'll do the copy. And everyone's happy, to a certain extent anyway, right? But it's really just, I mean, that's a lot of crap, right? I mean, look at how many loops there are and all this stuff. We might want to reconsider, right? And we might want to say, well, is that really all that more efficient anyway uh, than just doing a clip, right? So for example, if we instead decided to just do, well, all right, you know, let's do a for i loop through the entire voxel, uh, which we would have uh, up here, we already have that uh, in the test caster, wherever that guy got off to, here. Yeah. Um, so we could choose instead to just say, well, all right, look, uh, We could just loop over the entire voxel and say, we know where we actually are, right? Our current location is, you know, vox i x, y, z. We could say, we know that the person moved like a particular amount and we just want to move by like that same amount, right? So this is the, you know, this is the value uh, that we actually want, right? 
And so in here, we would just say, well, the place that we want to get this from is just the offset, right, of these. So it's, it's really just like, okay, I just want to do this, right? I just want to do this operation. I want to just do this on the whole voxel, but I need two things. I need to know which direction I'm going in the voxel because I can't do like the overwrite or whatever it is, right? So I do have that problem. Um, but furthermore, I need to cl clip this. So I need to go like if I, you know, I will zero like if, you know, inbounds do this, otherwise, clear, right? And so this right here would need to be tested to see if this, this was going to be inside or outside of the voxel, but then this routine, right, looks a lot more easy to manage. And like I said, the problem is this test we could write pretty easily. It's just whether or not after you do the addition, you're still inside the, the bounds. This presumably would want to be like this. Um, for that, although I guess you wouldn't have to. Actually, now I think about it, you could just do this um, and then do one test, right? So you could literally just do um, this. So I think that should be sufficient. And those are like sampling coordinates anyway, right? So you would basically say, right? And again, the reason that we don't do this is because it's unclear exactly how we would get this to not overwrite itself. So the only problem, and the only reason we can't write it this succinctly, uh, which would be really nice, right, if we could, um, and I mean, we could even do it a little bit more ridiculous than that, right, you could imagine this. Call it again, light voxel cell that. We could even write it even more succinctly, right? You could just do this. Right? So it would be very tempting to write it in this way because it's a lot easier to sort of read and there's just a lot less going on there. Um, what is the, what is it complaining about? Sorry, I missed the error message there. That is what is missing. Um, it's just not clear to me how we prevent it from overwriting itself because we just fundamentally don't know which order these two have to go in. And so if we were uh, keeping two voxels and we were just updating like a ping pong buffer, we could just run this and this would be pulling from the second one, right? So we wouldn't have to worry about the overwrite. Um, but in this case, I just don't know how we would actually make that happen, right? I don't see, uh, I don't see any way of doing that. So this, you know, cause this would have to be like that, right? Um, and that just doesn't seem straightforward because in order to start doing that, at the very least, you would have to parameterize these for loops to go in either, you know, which either uh, the forwards or backwards direction. 
So it seems like we're kind of stuck with this crap here, uh, you know, because I don't see what the like obvious other answer is. Also, I'm not sure why that was there. Um, so let's leave it at that for now, because that's really all I want to get done today. And tomorrow we can focus on uh, what else we want to do with it. Uh, but for now, let's focus on that. And let's, uh, let's go ahead to a brief Q&A. And while we're waiting for any questions, I am going to go in and put this back to linear because pretty much now we're, I think, keeping the voxel stable. So from now on, we just kind of need to figure out how we're going to do our blending. And then uh, I guess we have one more thing we got to write, which is the voxel sampler for the light transport code. Um, But otherwise, um, otherwise we're getting there. Since there's no questions, I guess we can pretty much wrap it up. I am curious, how did the microphone sound today, all things considered? We're going to be trying two different microphone setups. Um, I'm currently waiting for a little like stand thing, and I'm going to try a, a different microphone. But I tried putting a noise suppressor on the current one, which I thought might help keep it under control. Uh, yeah, uh, Roman, so what happened is the internet was out here. I don't know if you saw my Twitter. Uh, it was not super clear exactly what happened either. Uh, but it got restored, like, it was out all day and didn't get restored till like, 4 o'clock. So we streamed at 5 because that was as soon as I could. Um, I don't know if it'll be okay for tomorrow's stream. The message we received about the internet was pretty tenuous. It was like, we will run the internet on backup batteries for now. And like, I don't know. So I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know what's going on. Hopefully we'll be able to stream tomorrow at the correct time. But that's why like, I wanted to stream today at noon. And we kept waiting for the internet to come back and it kept not coming back. So we don't know what, you know, I don't know what to do about that, but that was the situation.
Really early episodes, just finished 10, reviewing where you are at now. What are some libraries that are added so I can study before I get to the episode they are added? I open jail or something along those lines. Uh, the only thing we use is open jail uh, is the graphics driver interface that we use. We don't use any libraries uh, other than obviously the C runtime library I think is still being called for sine and cosine, but we'll probably be replacing those uh, as well. So we'll be library -less. We also don't use any libraries for OpenGL either. We actually just call getproc address and link directly to the driver functions ourselves. Uh, we don't use a library for loading OpenGL. Try to give a guess completion percentage on the final lighting solution. Um, so I guess what I would say is I can't really give a percentage estimate. What I can tell you is that as far as I can tell, we're almost done with everything except figuring out how we're going to blend these values together. Like I said, we hacked in one today, just get started. Uh, and we'll leave that one in there. Tomorrow, I think what we'll probably do is enable full bounce lighting, because now we just can. Um, so tomorrow what we'll do is we'll write the voxel sampler and try to debug it. And then at that point, we can just turn on full lighting. That will give us full lighting solutions with full reconstruction. What we won't know is how the heck we blend those reconstructions. Um, as you can see, it looks really, really good. I mean, this part right here looks awesome. I don't know if you've been watching it. Um, for the case of direct lighting interpolated on an incredibly sparse voxel, it really looks kind of like a real flashlight, almost as if you were simulating the, the, the flashlight per pixel, right? I mean, that just looks so good right there. Uh, I don't know. Um, so that part seems great. And so I think we'll be able to just go with that. The question is just, how are we going to uh, blend these values? And I do not know the answer to that question. And so I think what we're going to do is probably like, I think we'll be pretty much doing full lighting solutions, maybe by the end of tomorrow, if not by the end of next weekend. And that will be like, great. But then we'll be like, what do we do at these blends, you know? And so that's really the only thing. I think that's the, the thing that, will, that is going to be not final about it is we don't know how to do those blends. Right. I'm exploring spatial grids for collision detection and I'm finding it challenging to reason about how to handle collision responses. Um, I guess I'm not sure what spatial grids have to do with collision responses. Can you be more specific? Because normally spatial trees are used for determining which elements need to be checked for collision. But once they service that role, they are typically irrelevant afterward, right? Uh, so what do you mean by collision response?
Um, so synchronizer man, no, you don't really put colliders inside the grid per se. Usually all you do is you just have a grid and each cell of the grid just stores like a pointer or something. I mean, you know, there's a lot of ways you could choose to store the actual data, but each grid just stores a list of all the entities that overlap that grid um, or a list of all the entities that are whose center is inside that grid, usually is the more normal way to do it. And then when you go to do collision, you just take how big is my object versus how big is the maximum size object that might exist in the world, search all the grid squares in that radius and do the m squared collisions against them, right? So the grid is usually just there to like break the n squared problem down to a very small n. What episode do you talk about the blending problem you're facing? Not sure what you mean, like color blending or some numerical blending. Um, what I mean by that is that right now we have a definition of a light field that we know we can reconstruct exactly, right? And the definition of that light field is a light source intensity value with pretty much any fall off function that can be roughly linearly interpolated and a normal, right? And if we fill those in, uh, the way that we're filling them in here, we get perfect reconstruction of, of you know, inverse square fall off light sources, as you saw. However, while it's trivial to fill that in, if you just have a light source and you go to each grid square and say, how far away is this grid square? So that's the intensity and what's the direction and that's the normal, right? That's trivial and that was what our sphere test does. That produces exactly the right things in every square. So then even though we do this really sparse version of it and then you do the reconstruction, you get exactly the right thing. That's the light field. That's what I'm talking about when I say light field. The blending problem is once we step up we already sort of in that situation here, just in this test right here. But once we step up in a second to doing full light transport, what's the light field? We don't know. All we're gonna have is lighting samples that say in this direction, this is how much intensity of light I saw. That's what the light, that's what the, the uh, light sampler is gonna tell us. How do we produce a light field value from that. And the problem that we're gonna have is if we just wanted to reconstruct one light field, that's trivial. We just blend all the values together using linear blending and we're done, right? Maybe we weight the values based on how bright the light source is, right? But the problem we're gonna have is that we have the ability to do four light fields at a time. How do we produce four light fields from samples? We wouldn't know where to blend them, right? Do we blend them into light field zero, one, two, or three? We don't know. And so we would need some way of figuring out what the definition of which light field is. I've been thinking of ways I might try to do it, but I just don't know. And so we're gonna have to try some things, right? All right, I'm gonna wrap it up. All right, thank you everybody for joining me for a, another episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you as always. If you would like to follow along the series at home, you can always pre to the game on handmadehero.org. It comes with the source code so that you can follow along with it. Um, that is it for today. I'll be back here tomorrow if the internet is actually working, uh, which it might not be, but if the internet is working tomorrow, we will do it. Uh, so hope to see you back here for that. Until then, have fun programming everyone and I'll see you on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.